the relationship of capital to nature seems like it's coming to a, cr a head right now. Um, there are huge environmental problems on a global scale. And then similar to the way that Marx sort of talks about how capital deems nature as being free, you've talked about how capital doesn't want to pay for the cost of social reproduction. And I feel like that is also coming to a head right now. Are these two issues, the issue of nature and social reproduction, linked in some way? And what are the possibilities for crisis here that we can actually use to make a more just society? There is a tendency in throughout capital to exclude the relation to nature as a big issue, except for these occasional passages where he kind of says, you know, the history of capital is about, you know, destroying the land and degrading the land. And basically, he's kind of saying when capital comes to some new place, I mean, colonialism or whatever, and it finds abundant resources, then it simply just chops it all down and, and doesn't bother about reproduction because it's a hundred year cycle or something of, 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 of that kind. So yes, that's a, that's a big issue. The other issue that is not taken care of very much in capital is, of course, the question of social reproduction. I mean, his comment is simply, we, you know, the capitalist pays the worker a wage and then leaves it to the ingenuity of the workers to figure out how to, how to live, uh, you know, and how to take care of grandma and how to raise the kids and, you know, all those kinds of things. So Marx does not do a very good job of, of, of looking at either the relation to nature or questions of social reproduction. He says enough, however, to, I think, make it very clear that he doesn't regard those issues as irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I think what you've honed in on is the idea that actually, in the same way that Marx excluded them from his analysis, so the tendency in economic theory is to exclude them as so-called externalities. And politically, what we're seeing right now is to try and attempt by capital to externalize all those costs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, so now we come to uh, part three of uh, volume two. And uh, it's the macroeconomic culmination, if you like, of the argument in much the same way that the three chapters which culminate in the general law of capital accumulation in volume one are the culmination of the argument in volume one. And I think uh, you'll notice straight away that uh, one of the key chapters here uh, is called Simple Reproduction. That's chapter 20. Uh, and there's a parallel uh, between chapter 23 of volume one, which is also called Simple Reproduction. So um, it's interesting to bounce the two off each other. Uh, if you go back and you look at uh, the volume one chapter on simple reproduction, you find that Marx, uh, while there's technical arguments being made, uh, he's also um, saying that uh, his primary interest in simple reproduction is the reproduction of the class relation between capital and labor. Uh, now, simple reproduction in volume two tends to be very heavy on the technical side, and you tend, I mean, the, the social reproduction of the class relation between capital and labor is there, but it tends to be kind of marginalized unless you're watching for it. But I think it is very important when you're reading these materials here to keep in mind this idea that the reproduction of the social relation uh, is also at the center even though you're looking at these sort of technical relationships between production and consumption and all the rest of it. The parallel between this and, and volume one is a little bit fraught by the following observation. Whereas in, in volume one, what happens is you, you take all the bits and pieces which have been there and you sort of bring them together and then you create the macro argument so that uh, notions of theory of relative surplus value and absolute surplus value are absolutely crucial to the macro argument. And I think that is, uh, you know, it, it builds in that kind of way. Uh, the curious thing about part three of volume two is that actually it, it, it sort of assumes away most of the, the rich materials that have been established earlier on, not all of them. Uh, but, for example, uh, the question of fixed capital. 
disappears, I mean, it's br briefly mentioned, but doesn't become central. Uh, all of that very interesting stuff about differential turnover times uh, disappears under the assumption that everything turns over in one year. Uh, and uh, the, the, the dynamics also uh, focus, as I mentioned very early on in the volume, on, uh, on commodity capital and commodity relations. Uh, which actually does have a very interesting aspect to it, which we'll again get to more concretely in a minute, which is that use value and value here actually get brought together in a very interesting way, only at a certain point to be laid aside. Now, the introductory materials, which we'll get into in, in, in a second, precede what the, what the core of the argument is, which is these re reproduction schemas. And uh, the reproduction schemas have a very interesting uh, place in the history of uh, economic uh, thinking. Um, Marx's own innovations build on the insights of uh, the physiocrat French uh, economist uh, Kenet, and what Marx does is to try to create uh, a model of, an, of, of a working economy on the principles that uh, Kenet laid down with, however, rather different uh, presum presumptions. Uh, the model he laid down is amenable to kind of mathematical manipulation in ways that some of Marx's other arguments are not. And to the degree that economists tend to think, particularly in these times, that if you can't mathematize something, it doesn't exist. So what you find is that since this can be mathematized and turned into a mathematical kind of model, so conventional economists kind of like this stuff. And they've been able to use it uh, in their own uh, for their own particular purposes. And it entered into sort of macroeconomic theory, conventional mac macroeconomic theory in uh, some very peculiar ways. Uh, because it's not clear that what Marx's intention is in setting up these uh, reproduction schemas, whether he wants to use them as a, uh, a way to critique uh, capital accumulation dynamics or whether he is, at the same time as he's critiquing capital accumulation dynamics, he's also setting up a normative model for centralized planning. And there are some uh, passages in here where it sounds like that's what, he's, that's what he's about, that's what he's trying to do. And as a result of that, when the Soviet Union became the Soviet Union, there was the kind of question of how do we plan rationally uh, the flow of means of production and consumer goods and all the rest of it. So there was a certain fascination with these schemas, asking whether they could be actually utilized for that purpose. And there was a, a, a Polish uh, economist, a man called Feldman, who in the 1920s was experimenting with some of these ways to sort of try to say, well, we can use this framework for, uh, for, for planning building five-year plans and, and all, all the rest of it. Um, this idea was picked up by another Polish economist, uh, Kalecki. And the general argument is that two people gave rise to Keynesianism. One was Keynes, obviously, but the other was Kalecki. Kalecki came up with something very similar, but Kalecki built off Feldman, who built off Marx, and then that influence flowed into macroeconomic thinking and some of the first macroeconomic models of capitalist dynamics, uh, what was called the Harrod Domar models, which were built in the sort of 1940s. Evsley Domar kind of said, well, yeah, of course we, we, we looked at, at Marx's uh, method. So actually macroeconomic uh, theory, 
particularly of the Keynesian sort, tries to represent the, the economy very much in, in the style that Marx is trying to do it here. And then asks the question, you know, which is foundational, I think, for Marx's analysis, is the harmony and the equilibrium that gets displayed in the numbers that Marx generates, does that harmony and equilibrium, uh, is it likely to exist? And Rosa Luxemburg complained bitterly that Marx made it look as if uh, capitalism could accumulate forever in a harmonic way. And so in the accumulation of capital, she was highly critical of him. Uh, I, I don't read him that way. Uh, but in effect, it seems to me the question Marx is asking is, how can individual capitalists working in their own self-interest, totally unaware of what this macroeconomic picture is, make decisions which somehow or other uh, accord with what has to be there in, in order for the economy as a whole to function in a harmonious way. And I think uh, the general answer would be, well, no, it's very unlikely that individual capitalists acting in their own self-interest will do that. And of course the purpose of macroeconomic modeling was to come up with <coughs> fiscal and monetary policies which would be administered by the state which would make sure to push all of these individual decisions in this direction or that direction, which of course is the point of Keynesian uh, in interventionism. So these schemas have this relationship, if you like, uh, to this particular history. And at the same time, uh, there's another interesting question as to whether you can take these schemas in the way that you know, mathematical modelers take them, or whether we need to take them in a more kind of dialectical kind of manner. Now, if you say you should reason dialectically to a conventional economist, they will just kind of say, well, that's rubbish. Uh, so there's a very interesting kind of uh, way which, in which uh, we have to think about uh, how to read these schemas. Should we read them in, in a way a conventional economist might try to read them? And I think there is some virtue in doing that because you can uh, extract some of the, the properties of these schemas by, by doing that. Uh, or whether you actually want to think more about, for instance, the reproduction of social relations, uh, which marks is I think more, more interested in. And, and also I uh, think uh, more sort of uh, dialectically uh, about uh, the way in which, yeah, you might be moving towards equilibrium but you might be moving away from it at the same time. The famous figure of the ellipse that Marx likes to uh, quote uh, very often that uh, you can have a dynamic which is moving towards and away at the same time. So looking at contradictions as it were instead of looking at uh, the notion of equilibrium uh, theory. So there are some people who, uh, even Marxists, uh, particularly the more mathematically minded economists, who will kind of say that actually Marx is a, a, a sort of a, a macroeconomic theorist, uh, an equilibrium growth theorist. Um, and and uh, this is where they would take this these materials and start to play with them in a certain kind of way to show uh, what can be gotten out of them in that way. Um, but I think I'd like to suggest that we also attempt another kind of reading which is more kind of dialectical or more open to the question of contradictions, uh, tensions, and uh, the perpetual creation of disequilibria uh, which Marx frequently uh, invokes. Uh, even in volume one he kind of said the market operates in such a way by perpetual departures from equilibrium, uh, and then there are processes that bring it back into the center. Now, there are two chapters at the beginning here, and I don't want to spend too much time on them. The introduction, uh, chapter 18, uh, I think all Marx wants to do here is to make uh, as clear as he can uh, that uh, what he's interested in is the macro situation. So the bottom of the first page here he says, each individual capital forms only a fraction 
of the total social capital. A fraction that has acquired independence and been endowed with individual life, so to speak. I think this language is rather important because you know, a lot of people who sort of cite Marx make it seem as if somehow or other uh, the capitalist is not independent uh, and doesn't have an individual life. But Marx is making very clear that the capitalist has independence and is endowed with individual life. And he then goes on to say, just as each individual capitalist is no more than an element of the capitalist class. The movement of the social capital is made up of the totality of movements of these autonomous fractions, again this notion of independence and autonomy, but these autonomous fractions, the turnovers of the individual capitals. Just as the metamorphosis of the individual commodity is about one term in the series of metamorphoses of the commodity world as a whole, a commodity circulation, so the metamorphosis of the individual capital, its turnover, is a single term in the circuit of the social capital. When you start to look, however, at the overall process, which he does in the next paragraph, he immediately says, well, the overall process involves both productive consumption, that is, the utilization of means of production in production, together with the changes of form that mediate it, and individual consumption. And when you come to the individual consumption, he goes on to say, the worker enters the scene as the seller of his commodity labour power and the capitalist as its buyer. On the other hand, however, the sale of commodities involves their purchase by the working class, i.e. the worker's individual consumption. Here the working class appears as a buyer of commodities and the capitalists as sellers of commodities. So there's a change of role. And what this suggests, and this is one again one of the themes that has come up again and again in, uh, in Volume 2, is the question of what's the role of working class consumption in all of this? And how, how do we understand that? Then on 428, 429 it does an interesting kind of resume, which I, I've also briefly alluded to, which is the contrast between what he's trying to do in Volume 1 and what he's trying to do in Volume 2 and what is special about Volume 2. And he makes clear that, of course, what's special is this disaggregation of the circulation process into the money circuit, the productive circuit, and the commodity circuit. In, part, in, in Volume 2, of course, there's all this stuff about turnover times uh, and, and the like. Uh, and then he goes on to kind of say, well, what we're going to try to do now is to take that perspective uh, of all of those turnover times, and, or not turnover times, but those, those different circuits of capital, and then try to build on that the notion uh, of a macroeconomic uh, situation. So, as he declares on 4.30, what we now have to consider is the circulation process of the individual capitals as components of the total social capital i.e. the circulation process of this total social capital. And taken in its entirety, this circulation process is a form of the reproduction process. And when, when he says reproduction, please remember it's reproduction of class relations as well as the, the reproduction of uh, commodities. He then uh, inserts a, a, a piece about money capital and says, well, this really belongs somewhere else, but I'm going to investigate it here, and it does seem a little odd, because he then gets and says, well, let's, when we look at the money circuit, we see as if money is very proactive as a prime mover, uh, as he says on 430, and the top of 431, as the motor uh, of the whole kind of system. And then he makes a kind of comment, uh, 431, which is an important one, which we're going to, I think, come back to. He says, as, but we already, as we already showed in Volume 1, it in no way follows from this that the field of operation of capital, the scale of production, even on the capitalist basis, has its absolute limits determined by the volume of money capital in operation. Now, the question of the monetary limits to capital is, again, something that we're going to have to look at. 
one of the propositions he launched in Volume 1 is that money is a form of social power which is appropriable by private persons. And as far as the private persons are concerned, it's appropriable without limit. There is no limit. But there is a limit, in the sense that if the money supply is, if, if for example gold is there, then there is a limit in terms of the amount of gold. Now Marx kind of says the various ways you can get around that, of course, one is by increasing the velocity of circulation, one is by sort of making bits of paper and all the rest of it. Um, but I think the important thing here is to recognize that what Marx is, is suggesting here is that you should never approach an economic system and imagine that somehow or other there's a monetary limit to its expansion. And what's happened, of course, since we've gone off the gold standard and since gold disappeared and the metallic base of world money disappeared uh, in the early 1970s, uh, we in fact, you know, I mean, essentially you need more money, go to, the, you know, go to Ben Bernanke and say, hey, sort of print a bunch more and yeah, okay, fine. So it, 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 it's pretty limitless. And I think Marx is making the point here that in principle he feels that it's limitless even though uh, there are restraints on it by the way in which gold is the pivot of the central bank and the central bank is the pivot of the whole monetary system, as he's put it, but we've now wiped out uh, the underlying material pivot of that whole process. And this then leads him into, into a kind of a, a very interesting kind of little thing where um, he actually repeats uh, some of the arguments that are made in Volume 1 of Capital, uh, page 747 to 57 in Volume 1, where, where Marx is kind of saying, well, you know, you, you can accumulate without actually spending any money. Well, how do you do that? Uh, and uh, in the title of this section, just to give you a clue, is the circumstances, this is in volume one, the circumstances which, independently of the proportional division of surplus value into capital and revenue, determine the extent of accumulation, namely the degree of exploitation of labour power, the productivity of labour, the growing difference in amount between capital employed and capital consumed, and the magnitude of the capital advanced. And he then gives a list of the sorts of things that can allow you to accumulate without laying out any money, free goods in other words. Well, what, what are they? Well, one of them is nature, uh, so no, that's a whole free good. Uh, the whole history of the built environment can be treated that way too. That's a free good. Uh, science and technology and knowledge, a free good. Uh, reorganization of cooperation, a free good. Uh, in other words, Marx is drawing attention, both in Volume 1 and here in Volume 2, to the way in which you can accumulate, uh, and he kind of says, he starts off by kind of saying, all right, one, natural materials, uh, that's one way you can do it, so that's the one of the paragraphs towards the bottom of 431. A second is uh, the more efficient use of uh, fixed capital, uh, and, and uh, and then, again, from at the bottom he says, apart from natural materials, natural forces that co cost nothing may also be incorporated more or less effectively as agents in the production process. The le their level of effectiveness depends on methods and scientific advances that cost the capitalist nothing. The same applies to the social combination of labour power, accumulated skills of the individual worker. Uh, and then there's the stuff about, you know, how much uh, value is embedded in the soil through human labour which has been amortised and now is a free good. And he goes on in this kind of, kind of vein, uh, and then ends up uh, on six, uh, right at the bottom of the page, sort of saying, finally, it was shown in the previous part how a reduction in the turnover period uh, enables uh, either the same productive capital to be set in motion with the less money capital. So his conclusion is all this clearly has nothing to do with the specific question of money capital as such. It simply indicates that the capital advanced given a sum of value which in its free form, its value form, consists of a certain sum of money, contains, once it has been transformed into productive capital, productive powers whose limits are not given by the bounds of its own value, but within a given field of action can operate differently both in extent and intensity. And this means that 
a given capital can operate, as he says, uh, on a scale on which is cap uh, to form values and, and, and products, and how it does it is elastic and, and variable. And then a little bit further down, bottom of the page, he starts to talk about you know very long duration turnover times, uh, and brings in the production in these branches is therefore dependent on the extent of the money capital, which the individual capitalist has at his disposal. This limit is overcome by the credit system. Here we are again. Yay, here comes the credit system. And forms of association related to it, e.g. joint stock companies. Disturbances in the money market, therefore, bring such businesses to a halt, while those same businesses, for their part, induce disturbances in the money market. Then comes a part where you start to see the argument about rational planning emerging. On the basis of social production, i.e. socialist production, if you like, it would be necessary to determine to what extent it was possible to pursue these operations which withdraw labour power means of production for a very relatively long period without providing any product or useful effect. And it then goes on towards the bottom of this. The, circumstances, uh, the circumstance arises from the material conditions of the labour process in question, and not from its social form. With collective production, i.e. socialist production, uh, money capital is completely dispensed with. So you don't go have to go to the money markets. The society distributes labour power and means of production between the various branches of industry. There is no reason why the producers should not receive paper tokens permitting them to withdraw an amount corresponding to their labour time from the social consumption stocks. But these tokens are not money, they do not circulate. Now, it's this sort of paragraph, a couple of paragraphs, that gives you the sense that Marx is also thinking about utilising some of this analysis for rational planning of some kind. And, and, uh, and he's kind of saying, well, the money market is all over the place and you get these disturbances and disruptions. Uh, if you want something that's harmonious, you've got to go to rational planning. That seems to be the, 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 the thrust of his argument here. Now, how far he takes that uh, is, is another question, but this idea is going to come up uh, periodically, but it's this kind of idea I think that when, when people are reading it, they kind of go, oh, well, no, maybe, okay, we should take these schemas and use them. And, you know, when the Soviet Union needed to make five-year plans, we should actually be thinking in these, in these sorts of terms. So that's uh, that uh, chapter. Now, chapter 19, I don't want to say too much about this, former presentations of the subject. And here you get into Kenai's uh, Tableau Economique. One of the things that's been happening to me in reading uh, Volume 2 very carefully is that I start to find things that I thought I'd invented. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, find, I find actually, oh my God, it's all in here, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and, and now Kenne is a very interesting figure. And I do remember when I was kind of you know, researching a lot about as much as I could of the political economy of the time, um, that going back and looking a little bit at Kenne. Now, Kenne was a, a surgeon and a medical person, and actually in the, in the history of thought, by the way, the medical, what the medical folk thought and did has always been very critical. And as a surgeon, he was uh, fascinated with the transformation of thinking that occurred over the circulation of the blood uh, with one, my namesake, William Harvey, who uh, happened to be born about 40 miles from where I was born. There's no connection. <laughs> but but in, in the 17th century, uh, William Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood. And before that, you had, a, you had a, uh, the, the general notion of what was going on inside the human body was set by Gallen. And Gallen's theory looked something like this. There was the heart, I'm not going to draw it as a heart, but you know, <laughs> there's a heart, and, and this, 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 is, this is the, the centre of, of production of, of blood, and then the blood is distributed to the organs, the liver, the spleen, and all the rest of it, and then it's consumed. So the model is a kind of a, a one-way kind of thing, there's a production agent and then a, then a consumption agent, and, uh, the various, and so this was, 
This is the way in which it was thought of until William Harvey came along and said, no, it doesn't work like that. It works as follows. Uh, the heart is there, but the heart is merely a pump. And the pump merely sort of circulates to the organs, and then it comes back again. And so Harvey's kind of conception was very much along this kind of line. So it was a circulation process. And uh, Kenney uh, took that idea, and it was only when he was about 60 years old and he was a surgeon to, I don't know, people at court and all the rest of it, that he got interested in, in economics and political economy. And he thought, well, well, maybe what we can do is to model an economy in this kind of way. As far as he was concerned, uh, there was production at the center of it, and it was no longer to be simply considered a pump, so it was a production. But in Kenei's point, it was all agriculture. Agriculture was the true source of all wealth. That's why there was this school of economic thought called physiocrats. And unproductive, industry was unproductive. Now there's an interesting reason why you might have said that at the time, because almost all industry was artisan-type industry. And they were, I don't know, they were making you know, jewelry for the rich or something like that, so in a way, if you looked at what they were actually making, you know, they were making you know, nice things to uh, put, you know, picture frames for Versailles or something like that, and you could kind of pretty much look at it and not unreasonably say this is pretty unproductive, uh, given what it was actually being used for. So, so, so agriculture, and, but, so agriculture was producing the wealth, then revenues were going out here, to support unproductive activities like jewelry production or something like that, and then the jewelers were, were, then, were then sort of uh, obviously buying stuff from the agricultural sector, so in effect you're looking at a circulation of revenues and a creation of wealth. So this is the way in which Kenai set it up, and obviously this is what attracted Marx to this formulation, uh, that it was a circulation process, and Marx could then kind of say, well, I'm going to take out agriculture in here and just simply say, production dominates over all else, but there's the production of surplus value, and that's what's going on here, and then the revenues are circulating uh, around through different uh, uh, classes. So part of the revenues goes to the workers out here, who then spend it on, on, on commodities being produced here, part of it goes out to a surplus value to the affluent classes, and that then flows back because they're going to consume uh, the goods that are, uh, commodities are producing, which are going to be produced here. So this is what I've obviously attracted uh, uh, Marx uh, to, this, uh, to this formulation. But it is uh, a flow model, and, and as a flow model, uh, it has certain kind of characteristics, and Marx's kind of comment about Adam Smith is quite simply this, that Adam Smith mistook what Kenei was talking about when he, that what's left at the center in the Kenei model, he said Smith, is fixed capital. I, it's capital that gets perpetuated there because it's fixed. So this part, the revenue stream is, is circulating and, 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 and what comes back is fixed. So, Actually, Adam Smith interpreted it and screwed it up, uh, you know, simply by, uh, by taking this model and interpreting those terms. But even worse, uh, Adam Smith actually went back to something like the Gallon model. Now, Marx is, 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 is pretty tough on Adam Smith here. Uh, in fact, in, in Adam Smith there are two theories of value. One is a labor theory of value which passes to Ricardo and comes to Marx. But the other is the, the one that Marx is criticizing here, which is like the Gallon kind of model in the sense that what you have at the outset are factors of production. Okay, and these factors are, are threefold. There's land, labor, and there's capital. 
And each of those is associated with, with a stream. There's rent, there's wages, and there's profits. And the value of a commodity under this schema is adding together the value of the land, the value of the labor, and the value of the, of the capital. You add the three together. Now this actually, of course, is the foundation of, of most contemporary economic thinking. Uh, you say the value of a commodity is, is derived from the way in which land, labor, and capital get mixed together, and the marginal productivity of, of, of or ma marginal price of land, labor, and capital, the relative scarcities, for example. So contemporary economics goes back to this, to this kind of thing, where, where the value of the commodity is a result. So the commodity is produced here, and it has a value which is made up of all of those, those adding together the values of these three, that, and that's the value of the commodity, and then it goes into consumption, and it disappears. So it's a sort of a gallon, gallon model. And the result is that, that this way of thinking, which is the sort of Kenai Marx mode of thinking, is radically different from many of the other modes of thinking, which is and it's much more process based, it's much more dialectical in, its, in, its, in, it, in, it, in the way it gets laid out. And there are some people who continue to use this. Uh, mode of thinking, so it's not only Marx, one of the most recent figures is a man called Schraffer, Piero Schraffer, who wrote a book in 1960 called uh, The Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. Now the very title of that will tell you how close that is to what Marx is talking about. And what Schraffer did uh, was actually to show that all of neoclassical economics is founded on a tautology. And of course, the neoclassical economists didn't like that, so they decided to try and challenge Schraffer's mathematical proofs. Um, I knew one of the top mathemat mathematical economists at Johns Hopkins who spent about two years trying to prove Schraffer's proofs were wrong, only to find out they were right. <laughs> and, and he said to me one day, uh, this guy Schraffer, he said, he's disingenuous. There he was, he was sitting in Cambridge, and he was sitting there with some of the top mathematicians in the country, and obviously he'd been talking to them. <laughs> you know. I said, well, why not, you know, I mean. <laughs> and, and, and he said, well, you know, but what he, he didn't, he, all he did was to give the, the outlines of the final aspects of the proof. He never went through the whole thing. <laughs> and he said, I had to go through it, and it was pages and pages and pages and pages of equations before it proved he was right. And it was very disturbing. Now, the trouble with this is, if you form, I mean, it's a bit like that story I told about Hippasus and the Pytho Pythagoreans, you know. When he came up with the irrational numbers, they didn't like it, so they threw him overboard. <laughs> so, so, actually, w what did people do to Schraffer? Well, uh, they forgot him. If you talk to anybody in an economics program, say, who's Schraffer, they won't know. But Schraffer is an extremely interesting figure, um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, Wittgenstein changed from early Wittgenstein to late Wittgenstein, and the late Wittgenstein says, "I was going on a rail, I was on the train, going from Cambridge to London with my good friend Piero Schraffer, and by the time I got to London, I was totally convinced that everything I'd been doing before was wrong." <laughs> so, when 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 Wittgenstein started writing all the language game stuff, it was because of his interactions with Schraffer. Keynes interacted with Schraffer very much. And, and in fact, uh, uh, Schraffer ended up editing all of Ricardo's works, and, and Keynes took a tremendous amount uh, from Schraffer. Uh, the other thing that's very interesting about Schraffer was that uh, he, as you can tell by his name, he was an Italian, and he opened a book account for Antonio Gramsci when Gramsci was in jail, so that Gramsci could get you know, books and, and right, so that's just a very fascinating character who I got to know when I was a student because he was this very small man, who, no matter how hot it was, always wore an overcoat and a cap and a scarf around him, and he had very piercing eyes, and if you were playing tennis, you would suddenly turn around and see this guy staring at you. <laughs> and you say, who the hell is that? And you, you kind of serve and you get all nervous, you know, I mean, it was, it was, and, and he was held up as a figure of fun, 
by many people around, kind of said he wrote one significant article in 1927, hasn't written anything since. Uh, this was before he wrote Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities in 1960. In the Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, he says, yeah. It is, of course, in Canet's Tableau Economique that is found the original picture of the systems of production and consumption as a circular process. And it stands in striking contrast to the view presented by modern theory of a one-way avenue that leads from factors of production to consumption goods. So Schraffer well understood the shortcomings of contemporary economic theory. And contemporary economic theory has decided the best way to deal with him is to ignore him. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, you know, it's not very nice to be working with a theory that is totally tautological uh, and treated as somehow or other scientific. So, now, this way of thinking is kind of you know, fascinating to me because uh, I suddenly realized, and this is where the, 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 the Maya Corpus comes in, that in the preamble to the Enigma of Capital, I start off talking about this book is about capital flow and how nobody really appreciates uh, uh, this notion of flow. And I then say, my early 17th century namesake, William, William Harvey, like me, born a man of Kent, is generally credited with being the first person to show correctly and systema systemically how blood circulated through the human body. It was on this basis that medical research went on to establish how heart attacks and other ailments could seriously impair, if not terminate, the life force within the human body. When the blood flow stops, the body dies. In trying to deal with the serious tremors in the heart of the body politic, our economists, business leaders and pol political policy makers have in, have, in the absence of any conception of the systemic nature of capital flow, either revived ancient practices or applied postmodern conceptions. When you look at the situation right now from the standpoint of the Kenai type modeling of this, uh, you know from what's gone on in volume two in general that you interrupt the flow and, and capital is, is dead. And therefore the, the, the con continuity of the flow is a crucial characteristic. And a crisis is a blockage. You know, and it is that, that metaphor with the circulation of the blood, which is actually rather important. But then you look at the solutions. Gallon's solution to somebody being sick was to bleed the person. Well, what are the Republicans trying to do to the country right now? <laughs> They're trying to bleed the whole economy white, okay? I mean, seriously. I mean, all this austerity nut is about bleeding the body politic, right? Oh, this dude, you, you people have too much. You know, get out the thing. Psh, take it out. On the other hand, we've also got, you know, the Federal Reserve, which is giving blood transfusions into the economy, right? They're, they're pumping liquidity into it. So, so, you know, one half is sucking it out and the other half is, is chucking it out. I mean, it's a very nice kind of metaphor to think about the politics of contemporary situation, right? That, that actually, you know, the flow got constricted for a variety of reasons in 2007, 2008. Some people decided, okay, this is a great moment to bleed the whole system and suck more wealth out of it, you know, this kind of stuff. And, you know, so, I mean, okay, I can take these metaphors a bit too far maybe, but, but you, see the, you see the point. But, the, but the, what, you, what you see when you think about the world in these terms is a rather different kind of world. And this is the kind of world that I was trying to depict in the Enigma of Capital. And, 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 and I'm being very explicit about it, and in some ways the preamble to the Enigma of Capital is really my homage to Kenai. And I'd forgotten <laughs> that, 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 that that was the guy who'd actually sort of made me think about the relationship between uh, you know, the circulation of, of capital and the circulation of the blood, and I, I'd, I'd really just forgotten that. And I thought I'd come up with a great original idea, you know, three years ago. So, so I apologize if anybody thought I was, you know, <laughs> So it's very humbling to go back and read volume two and realize how much you've plagiarized it over the years. <laughs> um, so anyway, what Marx does is to kind of say, you know, Adam Smith screwed up Ken A, both by going into this kind of theory of value and, and going into this kind of one-way street thing, and, and also you know, failing, failing to, to recognize that this is not fixed capital, this is the return of capital into a reproduction process, and it's circular. Now what Adam Smith did take from Kenai was uh, the idea, I mean, Kenai basically in, in his writings kind of said, look, one of the reasons that uh, France is in a mess 
in, in the 18th century is because we've got too many blockages to flows. You know, and taxes and, and tolls and, and all those kinds of things and blockages and to the market and, uh, and, and, and rules and regulations and all this kind of stuff. And so Canet is generally credited with uh, the term laissez-faire. And of course that's what Adam Smith, uh, Adam Smith uh, met him and talk, uh, that's what Adam Smith took from him uh, very much was this notion of laissez-faire. <laughs> that if you artificially constrict the flow by putting a 20k on, on, uh, on this or that. But then also there are other aspects to it, that is, that is if, uh, w which became very, very clear, if too much is of, of this circulation is going into consumption, then, uh, and particularly kind of uh, spectacular consumption, uh, then you're not going to get a proper reproduction of of what, you know, um, what Canet considered the, the source of all wealth, which was, was what was going on in the land. Now he was in a bit of a bind about that, because who was on the land? Well, Canet wanted to validate the direct producers, i.e. the peasants and all the rest of it, but on the other hand, the landed aristocracy was very powerful, and if you challenge the landed aristocracy, you probably get your head chopped off, so he had to kind of pretend that the landed aristocracy were actually the productive sector of society, but, but he, he did try to merge it together and say the landed interest in general, which is both those producing on the land, uh, but also those who call, sort, sort, sort of owned it. But then the question was, how can you, how, how can you raise the productivity? So, so what he was doing was also thinking about public policy, how to liberate the flows in, so, that, so that everything kept moving smoothly, but also how to direct the flows in such a way that you would actually stimulate growth. So this is what, what Canet was, 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 was thinking about, and this was the framework of it, and of course it's that particular framework that attracts Marx, I think, uh, very much to, uh, to, to his framework. Are there any specific questions you might have in this, in this chapter? Like I say, most of it is, is taken up with this false theory that, uh, that Adam Smith is, uh, is peddling. Yeah. I want to know if there's been like, attempts to use on Strata to reformulate Marxian economics in this so-called new recurrent impact, and people criticize it for being not a um, dialectical process-based. How do you see those? Yeah, I mean, one of the ironies of the Schraffer case was that um, Schraffer's main critique was directed against neoclassical economics. Some Marxist economists took it and then used it to sort of critique Marxian value theory, and therefore said you have to reconstruct uh, Marxist economics post Schraffer. And so you have a whole bunch of books that came out, Steedman and, and all the rest of it, in the sort of late 1970s, reconstructing Marxian economics post Schraffer, <laughs> but, and, and, and essentially abandoning the value theory. Um, now, my, my view on that is that if you take the value theory as an accounting device, uh, then it should be abandoned. But it doesn't seem to me that that is what Marx's value theory is about. My, my view of Marxian value theory is when he kind of says, I take it literally when he kind of says it's immaterial but objective. Therefore, to have a kind of a metric of some kind that you think you can apply to something, in a very strict way. So I think the, uh, that interpretation of Marxian value theory that treated it as an underlying metric, which you could actually get the ruler out and figure it out, and Marx does sometimes make it seem like that, particularly in volume three, and, and to some degree in these, in these reproduction schemas, which is why these reproduction schemas can be taken off in this mathematical kind of way. If, however, you treat the value theory in the way that that we encountered when I was talking about the theory of deindustrialization, that the value relations are changing because, you know, all productivity is changing and that therefore industries are going out of business in Ohio because businesses are opening up somewhere else. It's a more fluid, immaterial kind of social relation. So if you treat uh, value as a social relation rather than as a concrete metric, then of course you have a different notion of the value theory. I, I tend to work with a with, with uh, the idea it's a social relation, and I don't tend to treat it as a metric, uh, 
although there are examples, and this is where this, this stuff is going to come up, where in, or, in order to see some of the dynamics you have to look at it as if you can construct a metric. But uh, what happened was that there was this, this kind of attempt to be very scientific about Marx, particularly in the 1960s, and then use that science and, and on that basis to, 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 to gain metrics. And there are still Marxists around who, who think in those terms and doing some very interesting work. I mean, Anwar Sheikh, for example, at uh, the New School, uh, still works within this framework and attempts to work with the value theory, but has a way of, of, of approaching it, which, is, which would be quite different from mine. But indeed, the irony, in a way, about Schraffer's contribution is it did far more damage to Marxian economics than it did to class and neoclassical economics. And I kept on saying to people, why would you abandon Marx when all those guys over there in neoclassical economics aren't taking any notice? They're just going to say, brush it off. And don't. Why, do you, why do you want to do that? I didn't quite sort of see it. In any case, I, like I say, I've always worked with a rather different notion of what is, what is value from the way in which Steedman and many others uh, looked at it. Any other kind of questions of this? Yeah. Could you explain again the title of the Schaffer's book? It's a production of commodities by means of commodities. What does that mean? <laughs> what we all get here is that, that you need to produce commodities to produce commodities. You need inputs and outputs, which is something else that I haven't mentioned, by the way, that came out of this, which is the whole notion of input-output analysis, which is associated with Leontief. Now, again, uh, Leontief was a was a, a, a Russian who came to, uh, is it two Fs or one F? Oh, well, we'll figure it out. Um, Vasily, Vasily Leontiev. Uh, now, what, what uh, Leontiev did uh, was to take over some of these ideas in Russian planning, I mentioned Feldman and so on, and say, well, actually, one of the ways in which you could uh, conceptualize economy would be like this. Uh, you form a matrix of some kind, and you have an entry here, and you say, okay, you produce steel, and you have a long kind of column like this, like over here, and at the end of it, you get the total amount of steel produced. You add up all of the steel. Now, let's say it's just tons, physical tons at the moment. And then you ask the question, how much steel goes into a sector called transport equipment? Okay, so you have a sector here. And you say, how many, and you enter a number here of some kind, which is the amount of steel that needs to go into the transport sector. Then you say, the amount of steel that needs to go into construction. Okay, and you end up with another number. And so you keep on going over across all of the sectors in the economy over here, and you end up with something like this, and you add up all of these steel going to all of these. So this is where the steel is going. Now, one of these will be steel. How much steel do you need to produce steel? And sometimes you do need steel, and this is going to come up in here. So there'll be an even entry here. Some of these spots will be empty. No steel is needed to produce this. Uh, but when you take steel here, then actually, as you, as, as, you, as you take all of the sectors over here, so you'll have transport here, and you say, well, how much transport do you need to produce steel? How much construction do you need? How much uh, iron ore? Do you need? And you end up, so you end up with a matrix of this kind, right? And this is an input output matrix. And what's very interesting about this is let's suppose you decided you wanted to expand steel production, okay? And you said, all right, our aim is to increase uh, the output of steel. Uh, this is the And we want to increase this. Well, we're going to have to increase all of these inputs by so much. Whether, whether the, when it's, where it's empty, you don't have to do anything. But if you're, if you're doing central planning, you kind of say, all right, we want to double steel production in five years. How much more iron ore do we need? How much more coal do we need? How much energy, extra energy do we need? And we can actually use this 
And we end up with a set of coefficients here, which are mathematical coefficients, and we can then simply calculate how much of anything we particularly need if we want to double the output of steel, or we want to double the output of automobiles, or, 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 or something like that. So this is what we call an input-output table. And it can be used in this, and this is what we, is really meant by the production of commodities by means of commodities. That you can only produce steel by taking a whole bunch of commodities and putting it into steel production. You can only create, you can only produce transport equipment if you take a lot of commodities and put it into transport equipment. So Leontier, this takes off from Marx's matrix as well, as you can see what the connection is. Uh, so, so input output, and this by the way is now is still the framework of national accounting. And you could use this for planning all sorts of things, like uh, it was being used at the end of the 1960s by several people, for instance, who were interested in the question, let's suppose you halved the defence budget. Mm. Right? What would be the impact? So you could find how much steel would be reduced, etc., 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 by halving the defence budget. What you could then do is to say, all right, let's suppose we halve the defence budget and we double the budget for uh, hospitals and universities. Yay, that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> all right, and then you could see what would mop up all of the resources which have been lost by closing down the steel or closing down the defence industries or, or, or seriously giving them back. So there's a lot of planning uh, which uses techniques of this kind, and it was very heavily used in the 1960s, 1970s. Now, since then, of course, nobody likes to plan anything anymore. But the the, the point is that that under social democracies and, and, and actually planning interventions, these were the sorts of techniques that were frequently appealed to. And, and you could see, you could then set it up as a dynamic growth model and do all kinds of things with it. And with computers, uh, of course, uh, some of the initial computer modeling done of national economies was done in this kind of way, and it is still the basis of a lot of national accounts. So input-output structures are actually very important. Again, it comes from, from, from all of this. In this section, Marx, especially I think chapter 20, Marx also deals with aggregate social capital. And I feel like he's working, this is where, what he's working towards. And he says that quantitatively it is the sum of all the individual capitals. And yet is very explicit about the fact that it's qualitatively different. How is the quality of aggregate social capital different than individual capital? Very often these distinctions, which appear to be inconsistent with each other, are really the locus of a very important contradiction. And the question that really, I think, underlies this last part of Volume 2 of Capital, which unfortunately, and this happens a lot in, in Volume 2, Marx is not very explicit about it. But I think the question that underlies it is, how do individual capitalists, operating in their own self-interest, produce a result collectively which is consistent with the requirements for the reproduction of the system as a whole? My view is the answer is they don't and they can't. Therefore, you're going to produce crises of some kind. For example, what Marx shows in at the end of volume two is that, just to go take the example of working class consumption, working class consumption has to be such a level as to actually make it possible for those producing consumer goods to market their product to both workers and to capitalists for consumption purposes. And it has to be exactly in the right proportions. But individual capitalists are not going to do that. You know, I mean, why, why would they even know what that is? Mm -hmm. And I think what Marx's mm -hmm. point is that individual capitalists can't know what that is. They can't organize their production to kind of say, ah, oh, well, I need to pay the workers just a little bit more so that that's the market. No, they're, they're going to pay the workers as little as they can, mm -hmm. and the market is going to go down. And yeah, So, so in, other words, in other words, there's, there's, there's a tension here between what has to happen in aggregate for capital to reproduce, get reproduced. Mm -hmm. The means of production have to be produced in sufficient quantity to allow the production of means of production and wage goods, mm -hmm. and at the same time, those employed in the production of means of production plus those employed in uh, the production of wage goods have to create a sufficient market to mop up the wage goods. You know, you can see the kind of connect connections mm -hmm. that, are, that, that, that are required. 
and those become much more complicated when the system expands and grows, and which it has to, you know, for, we know for other reasons. So it becomes much more uh, complicated. So I think what Marx is saying here is that when you sit back and say, what must happen to aggregate consumption and production in society in order to have balanced growth? And then you ask, are all individual capitalists going to be able to do it? The answer is no, it's very unlikely. Now the big question is, are they going to miss by a huge amount or are they going to miss by a little bit? If a little bit doesn't matter, the imbalances will kind of correct over time. But what this does is to suggest that there is going to be a role for public policy and of course macroeconomic theory actually builds upon the kind of analysis that Marx was making in order to create the policy tools to say the state should intervene in such a way as to guide things so that you do get balanced growth. I mean that's the aim mm -hmm. of a lot of macroeconomic uh, thinking uh, and as you can see they don't, it doesn't always work very well at yeah. all. Although in, in the period from say 1945 to around late 1960s it did sort of work. So uh, here we go into chapter 20 which is the start of the reproduction schemas. Um, and uh, Marx makes clear at the outset that he wants to look at the annual functioning of the social capital. Uh, and he says, bottom of the first paragraph, the annual product includes both the parts of the social product that replace capital, social reproduction, and the parts that accrue to the consumption fund are consumed by workers and capitalists, i.e. both productive and unproductive consumption. This consumption thus includes the reproduction, i.e. maintenance of the capitalist class and the working class, and hence too the reproduction of the capitalist character of the entire production process. Now this is the thesis I mentioned earlier in, in, in Volume 1 where, you know, the idea behind it is to talk about the reproduction of the class relation and the reproduction of the two great classes. I mean that's, you know, to, to bear that in the back of your mind because Marx doesn't actually sort of say that too much in what follows and you tend to forget it as things go on. Uh, and this uh, is, uh, immediately raises an issue uh, of the physical nature of that reproduction as well as the value flows. So on 469, uh, the main paragraph, he says, for our present purpose the process of reproduction has to be considered from the standpoint of the replacement of the individual components of C prime, that is C, commodities with surplus value uh, embedded in them, both in value and in material. So he wants to look at both the use value and the, and the value thing. He says, we can no longer content ourselves with the value analysis of the product of the individual capital uh, with the assumption that the individual capitalist first converts the components of his capital into money. So, in other words, you can't now sort of assume all those things you tended to assume in volume one of the smoothness of the, of, 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 of the process of, of realization of, of value. <clears throat> so the next paragraph he says, the immediate form in which the problem presents itself is this. How is the capital consumed in production replaced in its value out of the annual product. Notice it's the value, not the use value. There's a kind of tension in here as to whether he's going to concentrate on use value or value. But here it's the value of the annual product. And how is the movement of this replacement intertwined with the consumption of surplus value by the capitalists and of wages by the workers? What we are dealing with first of all is reproduction on a simple scale, that is we're not going to look at an expanding system, we're going to look simply at uh, a, a system that is simply simple reproduction. Moreover, we assume, and actually there are a lot of assumptions going to be built into this and we'll come across them one by some, but here he's up front by saying, not only that products are exchanged at their values, now this is a bit of a big of assumption because in volume three he argues that there's a difference between value and uh, price of production, and cost of production. And in volume, in volume three, he can say things actually change at their cost of production, not according to their values. But he's eliminating the volume three problem right immediately, saying, okay, everything ch exchanges its values. 
but also that no revolution in values takes place in the components of the productive capital, i.e. there's no technological and organizational change. Well, this is something that's very interesting about these schemas, we're going to find no technological and organizational change going on. Now this has been an assumption throughout Volume 2 of Capital, remember it cropped up in the first chapter, uh, and it's maintained here, which then immediately kind of says, well, you're ruling out all of the dynamic stuff we did in Volume 1, it disappears from, from view. This is a pretty much of a huge uh, assumption. And, and he then maintains, however, that at the bottom, that as far as revolutions in value are concerned, i.e. changes in productivity, they change nothing in the relations between the value components of the total annual product, as long as they are generally and evenly distributed. Um, so he's kind of pushing all of that aside. And he then goes back to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the individual capital, uh, before coming to the macro conception at the bottom of 470. And he says, this purely formal manner of presentation is no longer sufficient once we consider the manner of presentation that was set up for individual capital is no longer sufficient once we consider the total social capital and the value of its product. The transformation of one portion of the product's value back into capital, the entry of another part into the individual consumption of the capitalists and the working classes, forms a movement within the value of the product in which the total capital has resulted. And this movement is not only a replacement of values, but a replacement of materials, and is therefore conditioned not just by the mutual relations of the value components of the social product, but equally by their use values, their material shape. So the material shape is important. And that then leads him straight in, in 471, in the two departments of social production, to distinguish between two departments based on their use value status. The first department produces means of production, commodities that possess a form in which they either have to enter productive consumption or at least can enter this. The second department produces means of consumption, commodities that pass a form, that possess a form in which they enter the individual consumption of the capitalists and the working classes. So he then says, the total capital applied in each of these two branches of production forms a separate major department of the social capital. And he then goes on to say, in each department the capital has two components, constant and variable capital, and of course, next page, each department also produces surplus value. So that the total product, annual product of each department could be broken down into C plus V plus S. And then he says, well, capital consumed in production is not the same as applied, there's a fixed capital problem, but I'll ignore that. And then he sets up the figures, and I think it's worthwhile sort of just going through these very quickly, the figures in which he kind of says, well, let's suppose Department 1 has the following kind of configuration, that its output is 4,000 units of C, 1,000 of V, well these are really the, the inputs, and then it produces 1,000 of S, which equals 6,000. So its total output is made up 6,000 with 4,000 constant capital, 1,000 variable capital, and 1,000 of surplus. Department 2 is 2,000 plus 500 Okay, that's the way he sets it up. Now, you immediately notice that the rate of surplus value is the same in both departments. Okay, it's 100 produces 100, 500 produces 500, so S over V is the same. 
the rate of surplus value, rate of exploitation is identical in the two departments. Now, the question that immediately arises is um, what's the relationship between these? And so on 474, he enters into the discussion of the exchange that goes on between these departments. And, you know, without going through all of the verbiage, it, you can represent this in a slightly different way, algebraically, by kind of say, well, let's call this C1 plus V1 plus S1 equals total output is W1. Department 2, C2 plus V2 plus S2 equals W2. Now this is where you get into inputs and outputs. Obviously, if this is all going to be in balance, then the total consumption which is going on in this system has to be equal, uh, the, the total individual consumption that goes on in this system has to be equal to the total output of the consumer goods industries. So this is consumer goods, this is the production of means of production. So you would say C2 plus V2 plus S2 equals W2 equals the, all, all of the consumer items we have here, which are V1 plus S1 plus V2 plus S2. Right? So then these are all the consumer demands, and we're assuming that the capitalists consume all of their surplus value right, in consumer goods. These are all of the demands, and this is the supply. Well, we can immediately eliminate that because it exists on both sides. So we simply get the equation. An equilibrium situation is one where C2 equals V1 plus S1. That is the exchange that has to go on between the two departments, which is what exactly happens here. 2000 C equals those two there. Okay? That is the equilibrium condition. It is that the uh, demand for uh, constant capital from department two has to be equal to the demand for consumer goods from department one. That's what we're looking at. Anybody got any trouble with this? Is this all right? And this is what we mean by sort of inputs and outputs. So I, I think that if you want to put it in, in these kinds of terms, you put a bracket around this and a bracket around that and say, in order for there to be equilibrium, these two have to be, the exchange between these two, de two departments has to be that that equals that. Now, there's an interesting question here. Does that equal that in value terms or does it equal it in material terms? From now on, all of what Marx does is to decide on these departments in terms of their use-value characteristics, i.e., this department is producing means of production, this department is producing wage goods. That's the use-value aspect. From now on, you forget entirely the use-value aspect. And it's, but it's not clear to me that actually when you, you do it, in, as I did in that Leontief matrix and start to talk about it in physical terms, that actually something that balances in physical terms is going to balance in value terms. Might, might not necessarily do that, and vice versa. Something that does it in value terms may not work physically. So actually there's a bit of a tension inside of these matrices as to whether you actually construct them in physical terms or in value terms. In fact, that one of the assumptions, which is going to be built into the analysis right now, is the only thing that matters is the value terms. And it's not clear to me that in, exact, in an actually existing economy that that is the priority you would want to have in mind. As far as planning 
in the socialist world, I wouldn't be bothered maybe about value terms, I would be concerned about the physical things. You know, how much do we physically need? You know, we need so much of this, so how much do we physically need? It would be the physical things, not the value things. Because, as Marx said, we won't have any money in that economy, you know, won't, the money valuations will disappear. But, but, but here Marx is talking about a capitalist economy, and in a capitalist economy it's the value things that, 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 uh, uh, that really matter, but one of the arguments I would make is that in getting the value relations right you may actually screw up on the physical relations. So this is the framework. Now, what I want to do is to say, well, okay, this, is, this assumes that workers consume all of... What, what are the assumptions in this? One of the assumptions is that you're working in a two-class economy. There are only two classes, capitalists and workers. And it's capitalists and workers who do all of the producing and consuming. Nobody else enters in. Okay. It's a closed economy, a two-class closed economy. Now this is a pretty fierce assumption that that's the kind of world we're living in. But Secondly, we assume that everything turns over in on an annual basis. So this is not just everything turns over, so all that stuff about turnover times disappears. Uh, the third thing we assume is that capitalists consume all of their surplus value in wage goods, so all of the surplus value they spend, and workers spend all of what they get on wage goods. Now, it is obviously more likely that workers will spend all of their money on wage goods than that capitalists will, but uh, not necessarily so. Workers may want to try to save or something like that. If they start to save a bit of their wages, then disequilibria will, will set in. So, so there, are all, there are all these tremendous uh, restrictive assumptions built into this way of seeing things. But what you can do immediately is to ask the question which I posed earlier. To what degree will individual capitalists, working in their own self-interest, produce in such a way as to make, not exactly that equilibrium, but to make it so that it's not so out of whack that you get a crisis on your hands? That's the, the, the question. Now, Marx doesn't sort of go into that here, but he does a bit later. The bottom of 570 starts talking about, you know, the, the balance. And he says, this balance exists only on the assumption that the values of the one-sided purchases and the one-sided sales cover each other. The fact that the production of commodities is the general form of capitalist production already implies that money plays a role, not just as means of circulation but also as money capital within the circulation sphere, and we've already seen how unstable that can be, and gives rise to certain conditions for normal exchange that are peculiar to this mode of production, i.e. conditions for the normal course of reproduction, whether simple or on an expanded scale, which turn into an equal number of conditions for an abnormal course, possibilities of crisis. Since on the basis of the spontaneous pattern of this production, by spontaneous pattern I assume he's meaning individual capitalists operating in their own self-interest spontaneously, but on the basis of this spontaneous pattern of this production, this balance is itself an accident. In other words, you only get this equilibrium by accident. And further on down the page, bottom of the, towards the bottom of the page, these necessary preconditions all mutually require one another, but they are mediated by a very complicated process which involves three processes of circulation. That's going back to the starting point of volume two. You know, the money circulation, the production circulation, and the commodity circulation. Uh, which involves three processes of circulation that proceed independently, even if they are intertwined with one another. The very complexity of this process provides many occasions for it to take an abnormal course. My sense of it is, and I, you know, I may be wrong, is that what we're looking at here is the unlikelihood of this ever being achieved, except by accident. And one of the issues that arises, are there systemic reasons why not only would it only be achieved by accident, but that it, that it may diverge from this equilibrium condition in catastrophic ways. 
In other words, the question that is sometimes raised here is to say, well, there may be another kind of crisis, and we'll call these crises of disproportionality. Is there another category of crisis we can identify with the help of these schemas? And many people, I think, writing about it from a Marxian perspective have tried to integrate this into other theories of crisis and to say there is a, there's very frequently a disproportionality element. That is, this equilibrium does not occur. And not only does it not occur, but it gets less and less you know, as you, the divergence gets so huge that the only way you can get back into some sort of equilibrium is through a crisis, which again is one of Marx's lang pieces of language, right? Frequently, uh, the only way in which you can re-equilibrate a, a, a capitalist society which is going wacko is to have a crisis, and then that pulls you back uh, to, to something. So Marx's theory of crisis formation is often about disequilibria, which become systemic and then have to be corrected and can only be corrected through mean, by means of a crisis. And now, of course, one of the, one of the hopes of Keynesian, max, uh, Keynesian uh, macroeconomic planning was you could avoid crises by intervening through policy tools, monetary and fiscal poli policy tools, in a situation of this kind. So if there were signs in the economy that you were getting crises of disproportionality, then you could actually take means, find means to correct them. Now, this idea of disproportionality takes on another guise in our, in our contemporary situation. I'll just draw your attention to it because it's not the same as this, but you could argue that uh, there's something similar to it. One of the big arguments that's being made by the IMF and all the rest of it about the problem in the world today is that there are, quote, imbalances. And in particular, and this is interesting. There are imbalances between those countries that are producing things and those countries that are uh, consuming things. And you remember that line about the stupid countries that consume things, the, the mercantilist story? The imbalance between China and, and, and the United States is, is, is frequently depicted in contemporary analysis in terms about the relationship between production and consumption. The only difference is, you know, the production is going on in one place, <laughs> And, and the consumption somewhere else. But if you look at this language of imbalances in the global economy, and the way in which those imbalances, and in some arguments which come out of the IMF and other places, kind of say that these imbalances lie at the root of the crisis formation as it occurred in 2007, 2008. Now, whether they're correct or not, I don't know, but, but you know, it's a plausible argument. In which case, you would say that there was a very strong element in the contemporary crisis of crisis disproportionality of some kind. And, and that therefore, we should bear that in mind. Now, you, <clears throat> again, the actual modeling that's going on here is, 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 is so kind of, uh, the assumptions are so incredibly, you know, restrictive that you wouldn't actually kind of say this is a, this is a real economy. On the other hand, what you've done is to, is to identify a, point, a, a potential point of stress in, in, in an economy uh, in which you can make the argument that individual capitalists operating in their own self-interest don't necessarily produce this kind of result and may in fact, as they read the signals going on around them, start to behave in such a way as to drive the system away further and further from any equilibrium point. So maybe that is something that we should bear in mind. Now what I thought I would also do at this point is to take you into what we're going to do next week so you can see. The, the same principle uh, as operates here uh, applies when you start to look not at simple reproduction but at expanding reproduction. When you get expanding reproduction, what you get is this sort of situation. You have Department 1. And in Department 1, you have the original amount of constant capital. 
but you're now going to take a part of the surplus value and you're going to reinvest it in constant capital. So you're going to have an increment of constant capital. Okay. At the end of the year you take, you, you take part of surplus, and, you, and again you have the reproduction of the original variable capital plus an increment of variable capital. Expansion of labor force, expansion of means of production. And there is a certain amount of surplus left over, let's call it SO. And that surplus value is, is there for bourgeois consumption. All right? So this is, if you like, a system in expansion. And you do the same for department two. That is, you have C2 plus delta C2 plus V2 plus delta V2 plus SO2, SO1. Again, you can go through doing exactly the same as you did here, sort of add up all of the demands for consumer goods and all of the demands for means of production, and what do you get? Well, you get exactly the same as this, but that must be equivalent to that. That is a dynamic model. Marx works this out with numbers. So what, I, what I've given you for next week is, is, is this system worked out in numbers. Okay, so go over it and see if you can figure out how the numbers work. I mean, in effect, you're looking at a situation at the end of the year where part of the surplus value is now being, you know, the output of the end of the year is now being divided into the inputs of the following year. And this equilibrium has to be maintained as you go through. Now, there are some peculiar things that have to happen with the numbers in order for this to happen. And there are different reinvestment rates going on from one place to another place, etc., etc. So, all sorts of kind of questions of, of, of that sort. So, but this principle, I think you see, is, 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 is again very, very simple. But its elaboration in the text is, gets a little complicated. For example, the very next section, having set up this, this first argument, you know, this we're going to deal with next week, but having set up this first argument, Marx then kind of says, well, you know, we just can't talk about consumption goods. We have to divide consumption goods into sub-departments. So we'll have department 2A and, and 2B. This A is necessities, and, and B is uh, luxuries. Now the interesting thing, thing here is that, of course, the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class, has to spend uh, some of its money on this, uh, it, to eat bread, so it has to spend some of its money on necessities. So the demand for necessities is generally taken to be the total demand of the working class, plus that part of the demand of the capitalist class which is for necessities, and then there's another sector which is producing luxury goods, and so Marx then gets into this and says, well, what's the proportion in which uh, the capitalist class is, is, is consuming luxuries versus necessities? Is it uh, two-fifths or three-fifths or four-fifths? You know. So he does his usual thing, he says, well, let it be three-fifths and we'll see what the, what the figures show, and he sort of goes through this. Um, but the, the, the existence of, of this, and you can start to elaborate uh, on this schema, you can start to introduce all, all sorts of other uh, possibilities into it, but what he does here in uh, the next section is, is that. But uh, on 478, just summarizing uh, the argument, this argument we've made up here on the basis of these, these exchanges, Marx says, uh, this is the conclusion on 478 of the par main paragraph. The result of all this is that, in the case of simple reproduction, the value components V plus S of the commodity capital in Department 1, and therefore a corresponding proportionate part of Department 1's total commodity product, must be equal to the constant capital 2C, similarly precipitate 
precipitated out by Department 2 as a proportionate part of its total commodity product. In other words, I V plus S equals 2 C, which is what we're, what we're saying here in this relationship. Then he looks at uh, means of uh, um, the whole kind of question of, uh, of necessary means of subsistence and luxury items. Now, again, you get an echo of Volume 1 on 479, when in Volume 1 he talks about the way in which the labourer becomes an appendage of capital in the realm of consumption, as well mm. as on, in the place of production, that it exists in what we call a company store relationship to the capitalist class. It produces goods and then it buys them back some of the goods it's produced from, from the capitalist class. So Marx talks about that, but he, he does introduce into here uh, a slightly different kind of nuance into it to say, this is not, when, when, the, when the worker gets out there uh, with money in the pocket, as he says about halfway down, 479, he says the working class appears as buyer and the capitalist class as seller. That is, they're no longer interacting in terms of the class relation between capital and labour, they're interacting as buyers and sellers, um, because that's their position in the market. So when you see the working class uh, person in the supermarket, and you see the bourgeois in the supermarket, they may be carrying exactly the same things in their bags, uh, just depending upon whether the bourgeoisie that day is consuming necessities as opposed to luxuries. And then he says, well, this is where he gets into stuff about, you know, well, the, the bourgeoisie also consumes some necessaries. So there's a discussion of this at some, some length, and I'm not going to go into the, the details because, um, except to say this, that uh, there is clearly emerging here uh, a significant role for, for bourgeois consumption in the stabilization of the system. I mean, we've made the assumption that the bourgeoisie spends all of its money on consumption. But when you introduce the question of luxuries and necessities, there's a kind of interesting, this was one of the things that Kenet was concerned about, that if the bourgeoisie is spending all of its stuff on, 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 on uh, luxuries, and as far as Kenet was concerned that was unproductive activity, then there would be no flow back into, into productive activity. That was his problem. Marx doesn't put it that way, but you can see immediately that some imbalances are likely to arise because of the manner in which the bourgeoisie is consuming. And, and as a result of this, Marx does one of his, he does occasionally, which he gets surprised, um, on 486 he suddenly kind of goes, every crisis temporarily decreases luxury consumption. Now, this is where you start to get into the kind of confusion. Luxury consumption declines, the workers who are employed in luxury consumption uh, lose their jobs, so they are not going to consume necessities, so necessities go down. This is the way in which you know, something goes from this to this to this to this to this and feeds back right throughout the system. And this is one of the ways in which an economy can go downhill. You know, luxuries collapse, working class get necessities, so the demand for necessities goes down, and the, the, that department too gets into difficulties because of the lack of demand, it therefore demands less from department one, and department one goes down and it doesn't employ as many workers who put less. So you can see how the feedback effects going through this system can lead you into a downward spiral in exactly the same way that it can also go into an upward spiral. So it's very easy to see how this system can spiral. So what Marx does here is to actually describe the, the dynamics on 486, 487. And again, this, this, is, this clues me in to sort of saying, you know, this, this, this analysis is not about capitalism can exist in equilibrium forever. It's about explaining, you know, the dynamics whereby capital can get into a mess and once it gets into a mess, can sometimes get into a downward spiral uh, and, and, and sometimes into an upward spiral of, 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 of growth. Um, and, and then, but then, he, he, this is going to come up a bit in the next section too, the bottom here, he says, it is a pure tautology to say that crises are provoked by a lack of effective demand or effective consumption. The capitalist system does not recognise any forms of consumer other than those who can pay, if we exclude the consumption of paupers and swindlers. 
The fact that commodities are unsaleable means no more than that no effective buyers have been found for them, i.e. no consumers, no matter whether the commodities are ultimately sold to meet the needs of productive or individual consumption. If the attempt is made to give this tautology the semblance of greater profundity, by the statement that the working class receives too small a portion of its own product, and that the evil would be remedied if it received a bigger share, i.e. if its wages rose, we need only note that crises are always prepared by a period in which wages generally rise, and the working class actually does receive a greater share of the part of the annual product destined for consumption. From the standpoint of these advocates of sound and simple common sense, such periods should rather avert the crisis. It thus appears that capitalist production involves certain conditions independent of people's good or bad intentions, which permit the relative prosperity of the working class only temporarily, and moreover always as a harbinger of crisis. There's some difficulties with this argument, I think. Um, and I think the difficulties in part attach to the fact that if there is a two-class model, then the, the range of possibilities are restricted. And it's clear that if you know, suddenly the workers double, you have to lay out double on, on V and, and the rate of exploitation gets shifted or something like that, then you can get disequilibrium right throughout the system. So it is, it is, it is very clear uh, that disturbances of that sort can also be the source of, of, of major crises of disproportionality. But this presumes that there are no other ways in which consumption can compensate one way or the other. So it is true, as he says, that you know, capital doesn't recognize any form of demand except effective demand. That's true. On the other hand, when you ask the question, where's the effective demand coming from? As far as Marx is concerned, it's coming from, of course, production. So you have to track it through this, 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 uh, this system. And what Marx is doing is to say, look, to suggest that there's a way out of a crisis uh, by raising wages or doing something of that kind, that the problem will be solved or that some, you know, Marx is not a a bleeding heart liberal and kind of saying, all oh, the poor workers, alas, we should raise their wages. What he's saying is, you know, in a capitalist system, uh, there is only a very restricted way in which wages can move, given the dynamics of the system. And this is an argument he also made in Volume 1, recall, when he kind of said, you know, either wages keep on rising until such point as uh, the capitalist system says, no, we can't do that anymore, or, uh, you know, the, the, the wages uh, collapse back into some equilibrium position. So the model in Volume 1 says wage rates are going to be doing something like this in relationship to profit rates, but they're never going to be doing something like that. And if they start to do something like that, you're going to have a crisis on your hands. And what Marx is saying here is when you look at the dynamics of all of this and you look at the, com that component V uh, in it, and delta V in it in the expansion, there's a limited range of, of, of possibility of its maneuver uh, within this system. So again, the dynamics are important. Now, section five we read is uh, again what happens when money intervenes in all of this. Now, the issue here is how does value get transferred? How do the values move from you know, department one from department two? Well, they move by monetary flows, but how do those monetary flows occur? If you have to pay workers by the week, you've got to lay out money by the week, and then the workers spend their money on consumer goods by the week. You know, so uh, there's a, which, which means that there has to, in exactly the same way we found this in the turnover of capital, that you need more money in the system that is actually strictly required given the value relations because of the dynamics, so you need more money in the system. So he's making that argument here. At the bottom of 495, he says, as money, alongside its surplus value of 1,000 pounds in the commodity form, um, as money, this exists in an ever-realizable form. In the commodity form, it is temporarily unsaleable. This much is evident. The simple reproduction, in which, el which each element of productive capital in both Department 1 and Department 2 has to be replaced, remains possible only if the 500 golden birds return to Department 1, which first sent them flying. That is, the capitalist has to advance. Uh, their own, their own consum consumption, uh, in some ways, or advance 
uh, capital in order, in order to get capital back. And this is a theme which is going to be very important in this chapter, and we'll get to it at the end because it's an issue of considerable debate. Um, on 496 he says, once a capitalist spends his money on means of consumption, he is then done with it, it has gone the way of all flesh. So the capitalist has consumed uh, the stuff. And the realization of each of his individual commodities, the elements of his commodity product, it's about ten lines down, is therefore at the same time the realization of a certain quota of the surplus value contained in the total commodity product. It is therefore literally correct in the present case that the capitalist himself cast into circulation the money into which he converts his surplus value, i.e. by means of which he realizes it, and what is more, by spending this on means of consumption. Now we're getting to the point now where we start to see actually the capitalist throws money into circulation in order to consume, and in so doing realizes the surplus value that has been produced. Now this is a very weird situation where actually the capitalist has to actually advance the money to realize the surplus value that's got produced. But not only do they lay out money on production at the very outset, they now have to lay out money on consumption to, to, to square the circle between production and consumption. All right? and, and to get where's the surplus value coming from? That argument's been going on throughout volume two of capital. Where's the surplus value coming from? Increasingly, we saw it comes from capitalists consuming things. And capitalists supply the money to realize the surplus value that they themselves have seen have, have set out to produce. Rather weird system. I mean, why would capitalists do that? You know, I mean it, it doesn't sound doesn't it's, it's counterintuitive, and we'll get to some, some comments on that. Uh, in, in a minute. 497 he gets to the class perspective, and I think this is extremely important. In relation to the capitalist class as a whole, however, the proposition that it must itself cast into circulation the money needed to realize its surplus value, it can be more explicit, right? And also to circulate its capital, constant and variable, is not only far from paradoxical, it is in fact a necessary condition of the overall mechanism. For here there are just two classes, this is where the two class model is being made explicit, the working class which only disposes of its labour power, and the capitalist class which has the monopoly of the means of social production and of money. It would rather be a paradox if instead it was the working class that initially advanced the money required to realise the surplus value contained in commodities out of its own resources. The individual capitalist, however, affects this advance only by acting as buyer spending money on the purchase of means of consumption or advancing money on the purchase of elements of his productive capital, either labour power or means of production. He only ever parts with the money in exchange for an equivalent. He advances money to circulation only in the same way that he advances commodities to it. In both cases he acts as a starting point of their circulation. Now he then introduces just a couple of uh, caveats which I think are useful to, to look at. The appearance of commercial capital, the primary form of which is always money since the merchant as such does not produce any product or commodity, and of money capital as the object of manipulation of a special kind of capitalist in the circulation process of industrial capital. Now, is this relationship obscured or is it radically transformed by the rise of commercial capital? and the role of commercial capital and of money capital. In effect, what Marx is kind of saying is that, well, things do look different when you disaggregate the capitalist class into producers, merchants, and money capitalists. They have very different functions, and they play very different roles in relationship to this consumer, you know, throwing this money in to realize the value. The producers may not do it. In fact, there are good reasons why the producers probably wouldn't do it, because they're out to get the surplus value for themselves. But then the question arises, how do the money capitalists procure the money to do it, and how do the merchant capitalists procure the money to do it? Where does it, the mo all that money come from? So the dynamics start to look different when you, when you start to disaggregate the two-class model. And the second point, he says this, the division of surplus value, which must always exist initially in the hands of the industrial capitalists, into different categories, the bearers of which appear alongside the industrial capitalists as the landlord, or for ground rent, the money lender, for interest, etc., 
as well as the government and its officials, volunteers, etc. These fellows face the industrial capitalists as buyers and to this extent realize his commodities in money. They too cast their share of money into the circulation sphere, and he receives this from them. What is always forgotten in connection with this are the sources from which they originally obtained this money and continue to obtain it. If you look at an actually existing capitalist economy, first, first off, historically the capitalist economy has not always been closed. And it hasn't always operated as a closed system at all. So one of the ways in which you could get the extra money is of course through imperialism, neo-colonial domination, through extraction of surpluses from the rest of the world. Right? And, and uh, this of course was Luxembourg's argument, that Marx's answer to this question of where does the money come from is an unsatisfactory answer. It does not make sense for the capitalists to use their money to realize their, their, their money wealth. I mean, it doesn't make sense. It is tautology. It is, you know, it doesn't make sense. And so Luxembourg kind of said, that doesn't, this, this argument does not make sense. You've got, to, you've got to find it somewhere else. Imperialism is the answer. Uh, the other thing is to say, well, actually there are other classes around who are engaging in certain practices, and some of them have, you know, residual wealth from feudal period or whatever. One of the arguments I made in the Enigma is kind of, well, actually historically extracting wealth from the traditionally wealthy classes, like the landed aristocracy and all the rest of it, was very important, historically. But then there are classes of rentiers, and there is, of course, the state. And, and so the other question arises is, what are the, what are their, do they have specific roles to play in answering the question of where does the effective demand come from? Now Malthus realized that there was an effective demand problem in his political economy, and he says there are two sources of it. One is foreign trade, and, and of course in, he included in that the colonial system. The one source is foreign trade. Uh, the other source, he said, was we actually need in society a class of conspicuous consumers who do nothing except consume, <laughs> i.e. people like me, he said. You know. So he actually wrote an incredible ap apologia for, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of parasites who just sat around consuming. And basically he said, but they are very valuable to society, because if they didn't consume we'd have a crisis. They are our main means to avoid a crisis. So that was Malthus's answer. But there's, so there's a question here, which I don't think Marx is, a, uh, and, and I think Marx's answer arises out of the fact that he set up the whole of the argument in Volume 2 of Capital as a two-class system. And if you break it down, and then you kind of say, but then, then, then and again, when, when, you, when you've got this, and you put it against some of the argument that's coming out uh, when you're looking at the credit system and the rise of financiers and the bankocracy and all of the rest of it, and you look at, for instance, what's going on with national debt and the creation of money and national debt and all this kind of thing. I mean, my argument is that the demand is coming from the creation of credit. And that therefore, th therefore spiraling indebtedness is, Im is, is embedded into the dynamics of what capitalism is about. And the main form that takes is, of course, the national debt. And therefore the state has a very important role to play in answering the question, where does the effective demand come from? Well, it's, you know, right now we're seeing, you know, attempts with the Federal Reserve to do something about that, and the state apparatus in China is doing a tremendous amount to stimulate demand. And if you want to look at a sort of, uh, you know, uh, a situation of, 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 of massive stimulation of demand, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't buy this argument, I mean, I, I buy it in terms of the nature of the model he set up, but this is one of those things where the conclusion that follows from the model doesn't seem to make any much, much sense, either historically, and in fact it makes, you know, it, it, it's completely negative to one of the stories that is told about the Industrial Revolution, which was the important of, uh, importance of Quaker uh, kind of styles of living, which were you know, we're precisely not about conspicuous consumption. And, and, and was precisely about sa maximizing savings. But if this class is saving, it has to have some place to put its saving, and something to do with its savings. So the dynamics of the system, it seems to me, are, 
are being rather poorly represented here. And I think that's one of the big problems I have with Volume 2, brilliant as it is in many ways, that I think that its assumptions being so strict around this two-class system doesn't allow you to start to see certain other dynamics that are going on. How you externalize the question of, ex of, of, of effective demand by creating classes whose role it is both to you know, help the capitalists dispose of their product, i.e. the merchant capitalist, or providing the credit, you know, the bills of exchange that, that Marx mentions, or, or the case I mentioned uh, before, which is uh, when uh, you know, uh, financial institutions lend to the construction interest but also lend to the people who buy, then, then you have an independent kind of source of, of money power which is being utilized to, to manipulate effective demand within the dynamics, within the class dynamics of the system. So I think you're coming up here against a, a set of conclusions which are logical in relationship to, you know, to the model that Marx has set up. But I, I think it's very dangerous if you take those and kind of say, well, there's no, as some people do, some people read this and kind of say, see, Marx said there's no problem with effective demand. The capitalist will always supply it. I mean, you, would, you read this, right, and you would kind of say, Wouldn't that, isn't that what Marx is saying? The capitalists will always deal with effective demand, they will just find the money to, to cover it, to buy the stuff. So that the surplus is, is, but, you know, like I say, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't make that much sense. And even Marx kind of says, well, this only works when capitalists are working on a turnover time of a few weeks. Then they can actually afford to throw the money in. But if you're, if you're making a railroad, and, and, and it's going to take you six years to make the railroad and another six years to find out whether it's profitable. Uh, you're going to go 12 years, sort of just keeping on throwing money into the thing. To, 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 I mean, you must have a hell of a lot of money to do that. And, and once you built one railroad, you'll probably never be able to build another one again. I mean, in any case, most capital. So Marx says about those, that's precisely where he says, we need the credit system here. And I, and I think that actually one of, the, one of the difficulties is the fact that the, the credit system is not incorporated in here, which is one of the reasons why, again, I would want to, I, I think it was, it's very useful to have gone over what the credit system does and how it does it, because you can then see how the credit system might intervene in this way and actually disrupt that, this particular conclusion. And I think that's just, you know, one, one important... Uh, really important aspect. Okay, so we're running out of time now. Next week we're going to go on to the dynamic version and go through the rest of Simple Reproduction where Marx goes over all sorts of you know, nuances of, of, of what happens when this happens and that happens. Uh, the, the really key chapter is, is of course the expanded uh, reproduction and there's a lot of controversies about that and we'll, we'll get into that uh, uh, next time.